Welcome to You Can't Get to Heaven in a Mini Skirt. My name's Sarah. And my name is Jessica. You can find us at Instagram and TikTok at Heaven in a Mini Skirt or at Heaven in a Mini Skirt.com. And you can also find our bonus episodes on patreon.com slash heaven in a mini skirt, or you can subscribe through Apple Podcasts. We're doing two bonus episodes a month, and they're very fun. So come on for the ride if you'd like. And today we have an interview with an author. Her name is Sarah Stancorb. She is the author of the book Disobedient Women, which is the culmination of years reporting on women who use the internet to call out abuse within their evangelical communities. She is a journalist that has appeared in like the Washington Post, the New York Times, Vogue, Marie Claire, the O Magazine, the Guardian, like anything. You Basically can everything. She's. I feel like she's been in everything. She does politics, culture, the environment, and you know evangelical Christianity. So we had a conversation with her regarding, well, regarding her work, but regarding her book, Disobedient Women, which we will put in the show notes. And Sarah, what's your experience with this book? This was a heavy one. I will say this was a heavy one. So I listened to the audio book, which was, which is really great. But I had to take a break about like two thirds of the way through because it is heavy. Like trigger warning for those of you, if you've gone through any sort of religious trauma abuse physical or sexual or verbal abuse like it's a heavy book and it recounts the stories of lots of survivors and just the process that they had to go through to get justice it's a really important book but just keep in mind that if you're if you want to read it and have been through anything like that or might find that triggering just take it in small chunks and that's what I had to do but I'm so glad that I read the book and it was such an honor to have Sarah on because she has told so many stories that are so important and has been at the forefront of these big cultural shifts that are happening in terms of the Me Too movement and the Church Too movement. And it was really like interesting getting her perspective, but definitely one of the heavier interviews that we've done, I'd say. Yeah, absolutely. And Sarah is a really strong person. We actually did ask her about her self-care routine because I was like, how do you do this? And when we finished recording, I had to take a few days and recover from reading the book and recording and talking about this. So what I would suggest is exactly what Sarah said, is if you want to read this book and you are sensitive like me, to read it in chunks because I think the book was very good and very important, very interesting, and also very heavy. So if I were to do it again, I would read it one chapter at a time. And that would have been easier for me to internalize these stories because they're hard and these people have been through a lot, but they're so brave. And these disobedient women are very important in in every community and in the evangelical community where we're seeing a huge reckoning. So that's your trigger warning, guys. Just take care. And again, thank you guys so much for listening. Without further ado, here is our interview with, with Sarah, Sarah Stangorb. Oh, I- and it gets a little confusing because we're both Sarahs. Yes. <laughs> like Jessica true, will yeah. be like, I have a question. And then we're like... What? Which Sarah? Which Sarah? Yeah, that happened a couple times. Sorry, guys. You will figure it out. Okay. Bye-bye. I think starting like with a little bit more, like a little bit about your background, Sarah, like if you're comfortable sharing about your upbringing, your involvement in the church, just kind of what got you to your apostasy. I know that you mentioned Mm -hmm. that you, because you studied theology, right? And then- Yes, that's interesting. Started off as a Christian and then- and it as an apostate. And I always find that really interesting because like in I studied philosophy it was one of the something I minored in my undergrad. And mm-hmm. it was philosophy of religion that I deconstructed during that period. So my other major was philosophy. I had, oh, cool. Oh, and oh, I had a degree is correlated with future income. So <laughs> <laughs> very impractical education. But yeah. <laughs> it's so yeah. fascinating. Yeah, it, it really is. And I think it trained me in a lot of ways for work like this yeah. to kind of be able to take a step back and say, is this logical? What What's actually happening in this argument here? I mean, we could go in a lot of different directions, but I think kind of focusing on, on purity culture and like the awful abuse of power within the church, patriarchy, like I think we'll ha- I think we'll have plenty to talk about in the hour for sure. Do you want to give our listeners just a quick background of who you are. You do explain it in your book, 
which is called Disobedient Women. And it came out in 2023, which so I thought it had been around longer because I kept hearing about it. So I figured it was just like an older book, but it's not. It's new (laughs) and it's really good. So could you give us an idea of who you are? Yes. What is this Disobedient Woman? Yes. (laughs) Um, So I grew up in Northeastern Ohio kind of a middle of the road Protestant. So we were Presbyterian and then we were United Methodist. And I had a very kind of open idea of what faith could be growing up. I spent a lot of time at the library. So I was always reading books about all sorts of different ways people believed. And then in high school, my best friend started to take me to a different Bible study outside of our church. And that's where I was introduced to basically fundamentalism. And I was very, it was a very conflicted period because I I was a kid who read books about reincarnation and no one cared Mm -hmm. up until then. It was gay people going to hell. Women have to be quiet. Women have to submit. I had a very like personal spiritual sense. Like I really did feel like I could feel God with me. And I felt like I wanted to be a pastor, a minister. And I felt like I could do good in the world. And when I mentioned this to my great friend, who is also now under this fundamentalist influence, uh, he was gentle, but made sure I knew that's against what the Bible says. And that sent me in a bit of a tailspin. And that was also the same time that I was coming to terms with my vocal condition, which you can hear. Um, it makes my voice shake. And I didn't really know how that would impact my future or what work I would do. So I went off to college with questions about faith and questions about what God wanted. And I actually read the Bible for a class Mm -hmm. and read it in historical context. And that's when I realized this, this collection of stories and laws and human experiences and stories that help explain things. It's infinitely more complex and it it has so many inherent internal contradictions for some people make it a mysterious beautiful text and for me just because i had tried to become so rigid that when i saw this complexity my faith could no longer bend in the ways that it used to it just broke so that's me. I'm a dip school graduate, University of Chicago also, and I have spent oh, a decade and a half working as a writer and a reporter, and I now cover religion and politics and gender because I am still fascinated by people who struggle with faith, hold on to their faith, abandon their faith. I want to understand what this is that people are so captivated by and that Mm. can help them and hurt them. It's so interesting, like the draw of fundamentalism for people, because I do think that people like, like you said, you liked having that structure, you liked having rules and a set of guidelines to live by, but then the mystery and the nuance and all the internal Mm -hmm. contradictions, like I also, like that really resonates with me because I felt like I got to a point where I was like, okay, either either I'm going to be like a six day creationist or I'm like, mm-hmm. this is not real. Like I'm, I felt like I was you know, <laughs> lukewarm if it wasn't one or the other almost. So I, mm-hmm. I do see why people go to those extremes, even though you don't have to, I think. Yeah. But for that's some what, people, it's just not. When possible. it comes to fundamentalism, there is no lukewarm. There really isn't a, a middle ground for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I think that's absolutely the case. And I mean, with the numbers of people who have abandoned the church, like millions of people who have left over recent years, I wonder how many of those people would have comfortably stayed if they could have just done it and not had it dominate their every political thought or their every thought about sex or their every thought Mm -hmm. about their family. And... There's also the other side where once people started to leave, the folks who didn't really want to be there, 
we're able to slide out a little more comfortably too. So it's a mix. And it's yeah. so much more socially acceptable too. Like, like I know you even touched on that a little bit in Disobedient Women about how in the 60s, like everyone went to church and then now it's socially acceptable for people not to go to church or to explore different religions and spirituality and different ideologies. What I found really interesting was I know when I was growing up, a lot of the times they would say, oh, like we need more men in the church because there's a lot of women and women are more faithful and men are more likely to leave. But the numbers with uh, millennials and moving forward to Gen Z, Mm -hmm. Gen Z women are actually more likely to leave faith than men. And I was like, that's interesting. Like, could you expand a little more on that? Oh, yes. Because <laughs> you're I also, I, you're a fellow millennial, correct? Yes, yes. I said ill between X and millennial. So this is like been an obsession of mine for at least the last 10 years, tracking the numbers. I wanted to write a book a decade ago because I felt like we were on the precipice of something very important for generations globally without almost any exception. Women are more faithful than men. They uphold faith communities. They're the ones who do show up. And every time someone says we need more men, it's, well, you're not looking at the people who are actually here making this place work. And part of the hypothesis for why that is is that there can be a social cost for leaving faith. Women, according to some sociologists, believe that women are more sensitive to social risk. And there's also a lot of pressure if you're in a Christian faith community where if your child is not baptized or your child is not confirmed, you've doomed them to hell. We started to see in the odds this, this slide away from the church and the proportion of women kept growing. And I thought this is going to shift. Something's happening. And it just recently you started to see that with Gen Z for the first time ever, we have more women claiming no religious affiliation than the religion, and it's flipped. And I think we have this very clear trend for secularization, but it's also so different than what we've seen any other time. And I think it begs the question, why, especially in America, but why in North America are we seeing women leaving? And I think I just wrote a whole book why. Many of us have written whole books why, because of the way gender has been treated in our lifetimes and the way that women have been abused and men too, but women in particular, the way that those pressures have just made being part of a church so difficult and when it should be a refuge. Right. Like people become so disenchanted because you hear the world is evil. The world is awful. The world is full of sin. And then when you see that outside the church, people are being believed. People mm-hmm. people that have been victimized, people that have been assaulted, are they're getting justice. And people, you're like, why would, you know, why would the secular world be better on this than the church? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can personally that. say why, because we don't have the rhetoric of the Bible. But I mean... It's crazy to see that shift because, you know, growing up to like, I feel like women were predominantly the people that were at church. Like, I felt like the vast majority of things were run by women. Like, yes. there'd be like the children's programs and the nursery and all those mm-hmm. positions of power that were when women were allowed to occupy mm-hmm. underneath the umbrella of men. Do yes. you think that because a lot of women are leaving the church that men are starting to really tighten their control. And I'm not going to name names, but there's lots of people out there. (laughs) There's lots of men out there that almost, I feel like they're going further and further off the rails because they're losing their grip of control. I I don't know that I can pinpoint a causal relationship. I think part of it is it's just popular to be a macho jerk. Like, yeah. there's an audience that enjoys that. And there are the people who do still populate the pews. Um, shortly, some of it is these outspoken women are telling tales about all the men that I trust, who my ministry is endorsed by. 
And I think that's more of what's behind this. And, and maybe it is that's a, a different way of framing what the threat is. But I, because within the evangelicalism, it's not a doctrine that binds. It's very often the credibility that's borrowed. So it could be endorsements on a book. It could be, I've invited you to this conference, we're speaking together. So that upper echelon and the more powerful, influential ministers can then take folks under their wing. And then it, it kind of spreads out that way that people buy into the authority of another minister or by whoever has endorsed them. So if the people who hold the greatest power are now out of discovery of abuse, it is not only a threat to their own ministry, it's a cascade effect. And I think that it in general has changed the atmosphere that has tightened the reins on gossip, quote unquote, on hmm. standard, quote unquote, because all of it is a threat to authority that is basically just claimed like, I, I have claimed this authority, and then if you don't believe that, these other ministers who are my friends endorse me, and they endorse my books. It's a house of cards dynamic that I think, yeah, you have to, they, I think, feel kind of backed into a corner, and so that their little fiefdoms do not fall one after the other. They're fighting back rhetorically, legally, the soup of self-defense. Oh, my God. There's, yeah, there's like so much there. <laughs> I'm so cheerful to talk to Where you. do we go from here? <laughs> I, I think we knew what the vibe would be. After reading the book, I just feel like a lot of what we do on the podcast is talking about purity culture, talking mm -hmm. about power dynamics and patriarchy. Sometimes we have to do like lighter episodes because it becomes mm -hmm. very heavy. Mm -hmm. And I know, and Sarah, do you want to tell your story about how you came across Sarah's book and your aftermath from that? Um, yeah, yeah. You had interviewed Shannon Vaughn and then mm -hmm. I read Shannon's book and then I read your book and then I read Hashtag Church too. And then I was really depressed because yes. I find that sometimes like Jessica and I will both do this where it's like so interesting and so like you're just like, oh, my God, like I need to know more. I need to read more. But it's like mm -hmm. I wasn't following my own body cues or boundaries because I was so hyper focused on going down the rabbit hole and then after like I read like three books, three or four books within like a week. And then I was just like, I'm so anxious right now. Yeah, you had to take a really long, deep breath. So I yeah. had to take a really long, deep breath. Like, and it just like, it's so, I mean, it's so validating as someone who was abused in church and was like downplayed or never kind of had that sort of justice. Like that was something that it feels really heavy. And of course it's really triggering and brings up a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And I was like, mm -hmm. Okay, now I think I'm going to go to therapy again. Which is, <laughs> it's a good thing. But I think yeah. like it's a very human thing, right? When you've had a certain experience and then you're reading about so many other people, like, like it resonates with you so much because you're like, wow, like this is so validating. And one of the lines in your book that really stuck with me was like, I don't have faith, but it gives me hope. Like it gives me hope to see these changes within the church. And I really do think that like, I don't have a goal to eradicate religion. That is not what we do here on this podcast. And, I, you know, I know lovely people who are Christians. And I, it's cool to see that within Christianity, there's this whole movement of more progressive Christians that are, they are affirming of queer people. They, mm -hmm. they respect women and they're egalitarian. And for me, that's not the path that I've taken. But it is hopeful now that women are finally being listened to. And I know there's such a long way to go and there's so many stories, but the fact that it's being believed by people and yeah. the media is reporting on it. And I'm kind of happy to see all these male church leaders, all these people that abuse and exploited people squirm and also mm -hmm. have to deal with the ramifications of their actions. Because yes. whether it's someone who's an actual abuser or someone who's complicit in abuse, who's not reporting it to the police, who's just spiritual discipline or pastoral counseling, like this mm -hmm. is all too common. And we all know of stories that haven't even been told. And this transcends, like this is not just an American problem or a North American problem. Like this is all over the world within I'm sure within any high control group, but mm -hmm. within the context that I was used to, like as a Christian, like it's a breeding ground when you believe that you are under man's authority, you have very little agency as a woman. And so for me, it's just like, it's so encouraging 
to see that this is a conversation, that this is a dialogue. Because even when I first, like, I don't know about you, but when I first deconstructed or came out as an atheist in like 2011, I felt like it was a very like male dominated space, you know? Oh, yes. <laughs> and it's so cool to see, you know, there's like so many women speaking out too. Cause like, I think it was the only woman that was an atheist that I knew of was I on her CLE. And now she's a Christian. It's a whole other issue, but like, <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to talk about it. We don't want to talk. We, yeah. We're not endorsing her, but yeah, I felt like it was all like, it was like Dawkins and Sam Harris mm -hmm. and Christopher Hitchens and, and just as toxic. Yeah. Just as, as toxic. Just to say that. Yeah. Yeah. And it kind of gets in this, you get in this headspace where all the loud voices and all the intellectuals in the church were men. And then you go to this atheist space and they're all men. And you feel like, where are all the women? I think there just wasn't that community. Like people just hadn't connected in the same way, or maybe I wasn't finding the people. And statistically, like at that time, fewer women were identifying as atheists. Okay. Yeah. So I was just going to ask, like, as a journalist, have you noticed just in your worlds like a lot more women coming forward just like oh i'm an atheist now or i speak oh, out against yeah yes yes absolutely and they both real there are far more women it's interesting like the category of none oh and no and yes nuns the non-religious folks it is broad so that's not only atheists and i know it includes a lot of people who have some kind of spirituality and maybe like tarot cards they do on TikTok, but they don't want to be in a church. They don't want to be an organized religion. So that big bucket has a whole lot of people, but also the number of identifies atheists has also gone up. So as that like, larger statement has grown, the ability for people to just say, I'm out, has also increased. So that, mm -hmm. and if that goes back to that old argument of a social risk, it's less risky. Maybe that's part of it. Have you seen shifts in this culture now that there's like so many more documentaries specifically, mm -hmm. I think, have from anecdotally, my perception, they have increased so much in the last five years just about Christianity. Like even since Sarah and I started the podcast, I feel like it has increased like shiny, happy people, for example, mm -hmm. was a really good one. Have you noticed every time a new documentary comes out, do you notice like a shift? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not even sure if it's a shift. It's more, I think we hit a point where there are so many people having these personal experiences and like even just Hillsong. I mean, the number of people who've watched, I don't even know how many Hillsong documentaries there are at this point, mm -hmm. but the size of those audiences is not equal to the number of people who left Hillsong, but it, people have left some kind of high control church environment, so they have an identity with it. It is a unique it, it feels like a very unique experience. If the people around you were not in that type of religious community, they do not necessarily understand what you left. Yeah. So I think we have this broad audience of people who were part of something like this and didn't know how to communicate it. And then finally enough people noticed to write about it and make documentaries about it, then that was being reflected back. Mm -hmm. I also think we do have kind of a the a TLC sort of experience where like we have people who would watch the Duggars, for instance, who are not religious at all, but were curious and couldn't believe that people lived like this. And they kind of had a, like, like a sick curiosity type of experience. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also that. And I also, I do suspect that these many documentaries are also trying to explain the political moment we're living in. Like, Rofel. No, I never thought that would happen. I didn't yeah. grow up thinking that would happen. I thought that would just be a fight that people fought over for my life. Mm -hmm. So I think people also try and understand why over 80% of evangelicals voted for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. As the it rings back over and over, we're seeing it happening again. So I think there's also a necessary curiosity to understand people who don't think like I do, who don't have, I don't know, who are these folks? I mean, and, obviously, like the three of us were probably quite shocked when Roe v. Wade was overturned, but we know some people in the U.S. that were like, I was not shocked because this is what it's been building towards for mm -hmm. so long. And these are things, 
in your book, you mentioned that certain evangelical communities, the fundamental communities, there are certain ones that their goal is to get people onto the Supreme Court and to get Mm -hmm. people into power. That is what they're doing. And it's very strategic. And now we're seeing it. And that is so scary. That was, I think, one of the most shocking things I read in the book. And but that explains why so many of them voted for Trump, because they don't care that he's horrible person they just know that he's going to well he says he's going to do what they want essentially but i think yeah people all have their own set of morals and their ends are justified in different means so like, when we talk about evangelicalism in the u.s there was just like no room to get into this the book but the new apostolic reformation which i was involved with a group that's new apostolic and it is they yeah. think they have the authority of God, right? And they yes. oof, yeah, and talk. They're, like... they're responding to prophecies. Mm-hmm. And that language that they resides behind a lot of Christian nationalism, the, the quest for dominion, that to them, that is a moral quest that is making Christ's kingdom on earth. And spheres of influence, right? Yeah, Dark. seven mountains. Yeah, yeah I remember mountains. learning about the seven mountains like when I was doing a discipleship year in mm-hmm. 2008 in the UK. And like, you know, it's important that all of you go away from this and you're, it's important to get into careers and where you're going to be influencing education and healthcare. And they told you that? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So they dark. also told us to tie their student loans. <laughs> they told us a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, that's that's underneath all of this too, and it comes with different verbiage depending on what segment of evangelicalism you're talking about. But mm-hmm. to me, I mean, I've been researching these sort of women's like Christian patriarchy, and then it became stories sort of about abuse. But then Christian nationalism also started to bleed in all around the edges, and to me, it's like dominion by a different name it's just another flavor of the same drive it, it leaves yeah. a lot of damage in its wake i have a question actually since you've been in the deconstruction community a long time what would you say and i know that because the environment has changed a lot but what would you say the biggest lessons that you have learned or have your perceptions on religious people been challenged Proof. So uh, I feel like I've been an observer of the deconstruction community. Mm. I never really felt like a part of it. I've interviewed a lot of the folks that were the kind of like rising names in the community, which I don't know if that's me just trying to keep myself as an outsider because I'm a reporter or because I didn't <laughs> feel comfortable sliding in. But one of the bigger lessons I saw, and I mentioned this a bit in the book, is many of the groups that formed online were full of good intention. Many of the people who supposedly became leaders mm-hmm. were still in the process of peeling back years of trauma and an understanding of leadership, but in that term, and how to be in charge that was not healthy. And so there was just a lot of fighting that ends up happening, a lot of hurt feelings. It, it's this necessary thing where you have traumatized individuals who are the ones who understand the cost, who are the ones who get that you have to get out and here's why. And then they're entrusted with the way of leading other traumatized individuals out. And that is not a perfect system and it can fall apart very easily. So mm-hmm. I think that's part of it. I think also oh, it's the internet has changed like, a lot of what I covered is like the odds into the 20 teens and then on like recent years. But it used to be blog communities. Or like Reddit, like our yes. atheists, they used to go on there a lot. Yes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it was like a lump of people all together and they like, mm-hmm. got one another's personalities with their life and their a different story. But now it's less one place and it's maybe... I follow this person on TikTok and maybe I run across this person on YouTube. And so the communal aspect can still exist if the right people connect, but it's just, it's not in the, like the framework of how these things are bubbling up on the internet. It's different. Yeah. Um, Would you say like maybe better or just different? 
different. Like, it's harder to organize. It used to be. I would flip on Twitter, and if I saw uh, Chrissy Stroop hashtag something, I in a minute knew oh, I'm going to see this on like eight different people's feeds that <laughs> I out over. And that's because they could organize. They had a team of people that were all paying attention to the same thing. And, it's, and I think also the ministers who are in power and trying to be protective of their power have gotten better at playing with the internet too. And the yeah. influencers, like trad wives and what they're... Oh my God. I had to get off TikTok <laughs> for this exact reason. I like no longer... But it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And when that stuff starts in your algorithm, it just keeps going. And then you're like, wow, everyone's a trad wife. Everyone's a trad wife. Like that's how it feels. <laughs> Yeah. And I find like it's hard too because I find like a lot of the time is spent like making content for the podcast and then like recording. And then there's all this other information in podcasts that you're like, oh, these are so interesting. But like I have to be very mindful of like how much deconstruction content I'm consuming because it's it's a lot. And when you're already in it making content, it's it's really heavy. So Sarah S, <laughs> I have a question in along those lines is because that you're in this community and you're a writer and you're a journalist, what is your self-care routine when it comes to this stuff? <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> so there's a section in the book where I said, and I kick myself every time I think about it. And I believe it was true. And I still believe this is the way I have to operate. It's, it is true that I cannot absorb other people's trauma. And in a moment of interview, I have to... Like, if I start crying, they're going to try to take care of me. I won't get their story. I have to be stealing. I have to give them the space to be open and then share as much as they're comfortable with. And I think I've been practicing that mentality for many years. And it's also just to keep me objective so I can ask, are you sure about that? I don't understand the timeline. I have to get all the pieces. The book came out. And I thought, well, look at me. I've I've kept this I've kept this all contained. And right about October, I just wiped out. I mean, I was doing interview after interview. Some people were very thoughtful. Some people would be in a very blase way asking about the worst events of someone that just made me so angry. And then angry that I even that. It wasn't, I wouldn't say, like, vicarious trauma, but it's more just I hadn't let myself really feel as angry as I needed to about Mm -hmm. the scope of everything I've reported on. And I just sort of only did social media posts for a few weeks there because I just needed naps. So I took a lot of naps. I still say (laughs) naps. Uh, (laughs) But I think I try to look for little hopeful bits. And really, they write, I think it was November, a pastor of my town put together an event about the book and, and flew Krista Brown, who was just one of the key figures in the book. She's a survivor from the Baptist Convention. She's been at the fore of calling for reforms for a decade and a half. But, and we did a series of events. One clergy came and they ask questions about how to keep people safer in their church. We did a community event and we heard after from people. And like I had some, I think I put her maybe in her 70s, maybe 80s, who came up to me after indicated like it's been years and this is what we couldn't talk about. And she just looked me in the eye and her eyes were burning. And I just, I know. And Krista had a man come up to her after who was never, his sat and was abused. They were able, never able to deal with seeking justice. I, I believe he said his son ended up committing suicide. And there's, it's so much sorrow, but they were able to talk about these things in a church. And from what I've heard from the leadership of that church, it's opened up so much. And I think when churches want to, take a stand. And there's so many things churches take a stand on right now. Why not take a stand on listening and being better and helping people heal? And just seeing that I've heard stand, that, that helped me a lot. So mm-hmm. I think I try to 
like for the humans being good and compassionate. Yeah, like trying to think back to that time when you saw these people being empowered. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When you see the change happening, I can see that, okay, you're, it helps you retain your hope. But like you said, when people tell you these traumatic stories or when you read these traumatic things, you can only let it slide off your back so many times. Mm-hmm. And and it's something that I actually learned is that, yeah, you can bottle up your feelings for as long as you want, but they're going to come out one way or another. That is something that I learned in the church was how to bottle up my feelings. And it's not well, really I didn't effective. even know that it was okay to feel anger and healthy. Yeah. There is something very healing about seeing Christians that are standing up and acting as if I as I think Jesus would act and like mm-hmm. not like Trump, like seeing Christians that are affirming like I've been listening to my second on my Spotify was an artist called Semler and they're like a queer Christian. And even though I'm not Christian, I, I like love listening to their music because I'm like, it's so beautiful. And there's something so healing about being like, oh, people growing up in this generation they might feel they might feel safe or they're able to find church communities that are affirming and that i just feel like that did not exist growing up so there's something about yeah there's something in that space that is beautiful but there is still so much hurt and trauma and it's heavy yeah no and i think for me and this is very like specific to me but while i was writing my writing the book my father ended up he broke his hip and then we realized both of my parents had dementia and then he got cancer and my father was this alcoholic who was terrifying when I was a kid. So while I was sorting through my notes and the court documents and doing all these interviews and traveling and gathering stories, I also had this weight of I'm not responsible for my parents' lives and my father doesn't remember that he was just awful to me and he was frightened and still angry and all that, all these things were happening simultaneously. So I think that's also why I sort of crashed. Yeah. But at the same time, like it gave me, as I was just writing the book, I felt like it was, if I was going to try to find some glimmer of light in the coalescence of all of this, it was that it made me very philosophical about abuse and I was kind of like recalling a lot from my own childhood it realized how it affected me throughout my entire life but also it helped me differentiate what my sources were going through because even when I was a little kid I thought there's something wrong with my dad like this isn't the way dads act Mm -hmm. and for my sources they, they were told no your, your father's your authority, or your pastor's your authority. And so oh, and awful things happened to these folks. They thought it was God's will. And for me, it gave me clarity on the unique way spiritual abuse, which is bottled into a lot of these other abuses. It's, it's a different type of impact. Mm-hmm. And I think that did help. That was harder than I wish it was. (laughs) What was the catalyst for you to write the book? Because I know that you had written Mm -hmm. some articles beforehand Mm -hmm. on various other things, including like like spiritual abuse, purity culture, all of those things. Was there a moment that you were like, okay, it's time? So uh, to me, these were really just one off articles that each one sort of led me to the next story. Mm -hmm. And the mix of like yeah there were now these documentaries there are also so many podcasts that were kind of trying to understand like Martin Driscoll and yeah. all the rest and it just made me sick listening to them because so often they would call in the men who worked with these problematic pastors and even when they actually did credit the journalists who did some of the work to bring out these stories I knew they were skipping over the people I had written about who first surfaced the stories on their blogs, who first spoke up, or the women within the church who years I had called things out. And it just made me so mad. I felt like someone needs to tell the stories of these women who, frankly, through unpaid labor, made it their life's work to get the truth out. Yeah. So a little bit of be mad <laughs> that's good that's good anger can fuel all sorts of great stuff so we're here for it i'm curious for like what are some of your other interests as as a journalist <laughs> i'm curious because like i don't i know that sometimes people like it sounds like you have a wide variety of interests in this i mean 
this was an area that you went down and then more kept coming up. So you're like, well, I have to. But what, like, yeah. what else interests you? I'm curious. Oh, that's a fun question. I mean, I feel like right now this is just, it's just dominating it's dominating my work i read a lot about politics i live in ohio and i feel like ohio actually is still a bellwether in a lot of ways so i am interested in those intersections i read about gender i just wrote a story for eight a month and a half ago maybe that the tweens believe that nirvana shirts are preppy and so I was horse-stricken a historian and, and a linguist. And so I get, like, these wild hairs where I just, just like, I mean, the audacity. But <laughs> <laughs> but preppy, come on, man. No, they really do. If you look up hashtag preppy and hashtag nirvana, it's all over the place. They just, they, it does. What do you, it, like, how does that What do you think Gen Alpha is going to bring to, well, yeah. That's what they're bringing. They're bringing the complete breakdown of language is what they're doing. Oh, no. <laughs> Just screw with us. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. It's a fascinating rebellion. I mean, I just yeah. think it's so funny. So oh, I'm a bit all over the place in that respect. But um, culture, I am interested in culture. I like that. That's a good question, Sarah. So I, I had written down some questions. I, I do have one in it. And because it, it's just going to be a little bit random, but there's a whole section in your book about Sovereign Grace Ministries. Yeah. And I hadn't really, before reading your book, I had heard about it, hadn't known the extent of it mm -hmm. and the cover-up tactics that they use. I was yeah. wondering, what do you think is like the parallels between cults and these kinds of evangelical churches? Have you done cult research or do you try to avoid that word altogether? Yeah, I, I try to stay away from cult. Just what one, one person's cult is another person's really swell church. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think high control is descriptive, so I'm comfortable yeah. with that. Um, Pam Palmer, her story is one that I go back to a lot. She was a member of SGM. And the way she described joining the church it was a really beautiful experience that some people might say if they remember joining a quote-unquote cult. But in a pool, we joined the church, and then they sort of buy houses near one another. Mm -hmm. So they're geographically close. You're expected to join different prayer groups. You would get involved in that way versus a singles group, then a married couples group. And over time, the church became at the core of your life. Yeah. And, and maybe your kids went to the SGM school. Like it, it could fill up all the needs of a family, which can feel very supportive. And then in Pam's case, they had asked a teenager of one of the church members to babysit their daughter. She was just shy of three years old. And the morning after, the little girl came in and described being molested, which, I mean, as you say, you have children, just you know, the, their daughter knew to say she didn't like it and to tell her parents was huge. And Pam and her husband knew enough that they would be expected to tell the church first, not go to the police. And they went to the police. And then they called the church. And were, that was not looked on kindly. Mm -hmm. But they have gotten the outside authorities involved. And I think in a lot of churches, that's that key missing point. And maybe some of these pastors really do believe the church is capable of handling criminal cases. I think that's ridiculous, but maybe they believe that. However, the way it works in practice is it breeds cover up because you're not going to a criminal authority to investigate a crime. You're putting it in the hands of ministers whose reputation depends upon things like this not being made public. And what she went through and her being a coach to forgive the boy. It's one of the more painful stories that I've heard. And the fear that her daughter still had. It's one of the stories and I shared this in the book <clears throat> when they were asked to, you know, give their forgiveness to this boy. Pam's daughter came in and saw him and hid under her chair. 
And in that moment, because she was so conditioned to be a good wife and be a good mother within the eyes of the church, she scooped up her daughter and held her on her lap. And this kid was petrified. And Pam's voice, when she told me this story, that was one of those moments that almost broke me because it almost broke her. It was what was expected of her in that moment and still regrets it because she didn't do what she now you know, sees her kid needed. Um, but I think that an example of that, that level of control over your behavior, or even in a moment like that, is a lot to break free from. And this this story was very difficult to read. And the, one of the biggest things that stood out to me was that she said the word secular authority. And yeah. just hearing that phrase, it that's what the red flag started to rise in my mind, is that yeah. if anyone is referring to police as secular authorities that makes me feel like this is more than just a religion this is high control this is where we're getting into cult territory depending on your (laughs) definition of cult and it was very powerful in how pam it it teaches you to tamp down your instincts Mm -hmm. because i'm sure instinctually she did not want to be in that meeting well you shouldn't trust the flesh right like Mm -hmm. there's that natural separation that that is created and conditioned over time yeah, and these, I, I know the, the book is difficult. And I'm hearing from people who bought it in August saying, I just finished it. Oh, <laughs> I really? I had to take it in little pieces because they lived some version of it. But I don't know if it was for the best or not to be so blunt. I th- personally, look, I know that my opinion isn't, <laughs> isn't like everyone's opinion, but, and I have said a, a lot that this book is heavy, but I think it's, really amazing and I think the bluntness and you did explain this in your book you're like I'm gonna be blunt here I think the warning was good but it was also just I think it was necessary I think bluntness is what we need I think we need to call a spade a spade in these contexts because sometimes you'll say like he he sinned or blah blah it's like no he was a rapist or he sexually assaulted someone I think sometimes that that language does seem like intense and maybe triggering to some people and they might have to not read the book or take it in smaller doses, Mm -hmm. like you said, some readers have done, me included. But I still think it was so important. And I think we just like we we need to just clearly state what's happening. And that's something that even on our social media page, like I made a post today about like how Bathsheba was raped. Bathsheba was not a temptress. And I think sometimes when we were growing up and we had Bible stories that we were being told, it was the same sort of thing. It was the language was always very vague and a lot of the blame as happens with purity culture is placed on women when you're like oh my god we just need to hold men accountable for their actions and that's exactly what your book was saying and doing not just men abusers and i recognize that men and non-binary people are also victims and of this as well but i think it was i think it was so needed it's real it's going to be interesting to see where things go culturally i know this is a big year especially in politics for United States, like our federal election is coming up in 2025. And there's mm-hmm. similar, similar big political divides that are happening in mm-hmm. Canada, like things that like we never thought would happen, like mm-hmm. nationwide coordinated anti-trans protests, bans on making kids have to be outed to their parents and in education policies. Like there, there are all these things that we, you know, we look at the states sometimes and sometimes Canadians are like, oh, that could never happen here. But like, this can and will happen if people aren't speaking up, right? And it's for the same reason as it is in the U.S. is that a lot of religious groups are getting very comfortable with politicians and making a lot of Mm. things happen. And it's coordinated. It's awful and depressing and it's trickling up here. So I think what I love about your book is that it, I hope more even secular people read it because people need to be educated and people need to understand what is happening. Mm-hmm. I'm really glad that you were brave enough to, you know, write this book and put your trauma on the line and really <laughs> and I know that it's exhausting, but I think it's still so important. So yeah. and I'm really glad that you talked to us today. We are we're coming up on the hour, so wondering if Sarah, did you have any more questions or do you have any questions for us or do you have anything else you'd like to say? I'll take any other questions. I thought <laughs> it was confusing. I didn't know which Sarah you meant at first. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we're both. It's like, sorry. <laughs> Forgot, yeah, sometimes when we're interviewing people, we ask them if they have questions for us because that happened to us once when we were being interviewed and we we're like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Or did you have Sarah S. Do you have anything else you would like to say or plug while you're here? 
I do hope more people who are not currently in the church do get a chance to read the book. In my writing for magazines, I notice when I write a story, maybe the one about stay-at-home daughters, I don't really hear any of these stories. I would see it my social media, a mix of people who are still in the church and say, well, this is wrong. And then I'd see people who left the church who didn't want anything to do with the church in their own lives, but still care about how people are treated within the church. And I would see civil dialogue between people who had fundamental disagreements, mm. but both cared about how other human beings are treated. And I love seeing that when people are talking about this book, because I don't think this is a solution that only comes from the church. And I definitely don't think the ramifications are only within the church. So anything folks can do to help get this out more broadly, I think it would help all of us understand a little bit better what's going on. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Everybody, go buy Sarah's book. It's incredible. Disobedient Women. If you have to take it in small chunks, do it that way. But these are really important stories. And it's available on Audible. I listened to the audiobook, which was also really great. So thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Get the